Perfect, yes, thanks. Um, so um, uh, so what, where I move to now is where, in some sense, the South African policy debate is. In uh, February earlier on this year, South Africa, in its budget, announced its intentions to explore, co concretely explore, the opportunity of introducing a carbon tax in 2014. And so, um, in a way, it's in a period of evaluation, how best to design an instrument that could potentially be adopted by the, by the South African government and implemented in, in a couple of years' time. Um, this is some work that we did with, with the National Treasury, with Constantine's group, and there's a large number of people involved, and, and I'm the lucky one who gets to present it. It's been a really exciting process. What we're looking at is, in some ways, picking up where, where Alison um, left off and building on the database that, uh, that, that Rob was talking about earlier, looking at, at, um, looking at, at what, what the additional economic impacts of a carbon tax would be and whether or not or what level of a carbon tax would be needed in order for South Africa to, emit, to, to meet those very ambitious emissions reduction targets that Alison was just talking about that came out of that LTMS uh, process, that roundtable discussion process. Um, I'm not going to draw too much on this because this is just another way of looking at some of the data that Rob's already looked at, except to say that um, you can see very clearly that emissions... Oh, do I have to stay here? Um, you can see very clearly that emissions um, per, per unit of energy use, which is how dirty is South Africa's energy, and you can see that South Africa is, a, is right at the top amongst all the countries in the world as one of the dirtiest energy um, countries, and also a fairly high um, energy user per person. All I'm drawing from this graph is, is just to convey just the challenges that are involved for South Africa to adopt a low carbon growth path, that it really requires South Africa not to follow the path that the rest of the developed world has followed. It has to sharply turn the corner. Um, and so this pledge of reducing carbon emissions by 42, well, greenhouse gas emissions by 42% by, by 2025, even though it's relative to a baseline scenario that is very dirty, very carbon intensive, even that is a very challenging proposition for, for South Africa. So what we, what we did with, with Constantine's group is we developed an energy, um, it's, it's not really a true energy model, that's the work we're doing now, but it's an energy, it's, it's an economy-wide economic model of the South African economy with a lot of energy detail in it, right? We're at this stage now working with Alison and Bruno and Tara to try and uh, get a proper energy economic model link. Um, but we're going to be picking up from where Alison left off. We'll get to that in a second. What we do is we start with the database that Rob was talking about, where it has a great deal of sectoral detail, household detail, um, and a lot of information on the, on the energy sector. And this is a mathematical representation of the South African economy. We parameterize the model based on the data that, that Rob was pr presenting. And then we run the model forward into the future in a way as uh, an unconstrained emissions scenario. So without any attempts to try and curb emissions, to replicate, um, uh, well, to some extent, extent follow uh, what, what Alison was, was talking about was the, uh, was the baseline scenario for the emissions reduction target. And then we're going to impose on the model the energy sector, right? So what, what investments are being made in the energy sector, and we're going to treat those as, as predetermined. Those are determined by a different policy process than the carbon tax. They're determined by South Africa's um, negotiated, the South African government's negotiated investment plan with the national electricity provider. So we're going to take that as given. Right. And we're going to ask, what is the additional um, implications of a carbon tax, right? What, are, um, what level of carbon tax is needed over and above the electricity build plan in order to meet the national emissions reduction targets? And this model, which is a dynamic model, allows us to trace the, the, the deviation in economic growth, employment, um, and a number of detailed uh, economic indicators from that baseline. Um, so not, not just changes in emissions. Um, right. As I said, the model has a lot of energy detail. Alison was talking about just how complex the South African energy sector is, particularly for a developing country. Um, we have uh, coal, natural gas, and crude oil coming into the system. A number of ways of producing electricity, a number of ways of producing um, fuels. One of them, I think, is the dirtiest in the world, the coal to liquid. Or if it's not, it's a good contender. And, um, and so these, uh, these complex inter inter interactions between fossil fuels in order to produce the electricity and the fuel at the end, and then its transmission to the final users, all of this complex interactions are, um, are included inside the model. Very simply put, we also include inside the model a, a mechanism for improving energy efficiency, so reducing the energy intensity based on prices. In other words, if prices rise, producers in our model start to find ways to try and reduce their energy intensity, to have fewer inputs going into the energy inputs going into the production process. But they are limited to the extent in which they can just simply respond to prices by just 
what's happening to the level of investment going into their sectors. In other words, if you're a sector whose returns are declining, you are very limited in how, how quickly you can, you can retool your, your factory to use more energy efficient um, m machinery. Right? Whereas if you're a very attractive and fast growing sector, uh, you are far more likely to be replacing your capital and, and being a, a bigger recipient of new capital investment every period. And so what that means is that you're going to find it much easier to adapt to, to changes in, in energy prices. So we capture both changes in energy supply and energy um, efficiency. We're going to run a number of scenarios. The most obvious one is what is the impact of a domestic carbon tax? If South Africa introduces a carbon tax, what is the impact of the, on the economy? We're going to apply this, cop, this carbon tax at the point at which fuel enter, the fossil fuels enter the economy, right? So it's, it's a tax on the fossil fuels. It's going to start at $3 per ton in 2012, and it's going to gradually rise um, to, to $30 US dollars by, by 2022, right? And what's going to happen, this is a very important part of the story about carbon taxes, what's going to happen to the tax revenues that are collected? How are they going to be recycled back into the system? And we're going to start with this basic scenario by saying, let's just recycle it back into the South African economy by reducing sales taxes uniformly. This is a, a neutral adjustment. Everybody's buying goods in the economy, so everybody benefits by recycling those taxes back into the economy. We're going to look at some other options later on. Then we're going to look at a domestic border tax adjustment. As Rob was saying, there's a lot of carbon embodied in the imports coming into South Africa, the plastic buckets coming from, from different parts of the world. They could be coming from a very clean Iceland, or they could be coming from a very dirty China. But there is carbon embodied inside that plastic bucket. Just because it's not produced in South Africa, there are some arguments that if you are consuming it, you should pay for the tax that uh, the carbon that was that was burned in order to produce it. Likewise, if you are not consuming the goods that you are producing in your country, you're exporting them to Europe, then it's the Europeans who knew who should pay for for using the carbon embodied in the commodities that they are buying from South Africa. Right. So it's a rebate on the on the carbon within exports, and it's an additional tax. Like, a, like, a, like an excise tax on the imports coming into the, into the country. And then we're going to look at that foreign border tax adjustment. What happens if South Africa says, I'm not emitting, I'm, I'm not going to reduce my, I'm not going to introduce a carbon tax or reduce emissions, but the rest of the world says, actually, no, we're going to tax you based on the carbon inside your products. So it's a tax on South African exports into foreign markets. This is very much a concern that Alison was talking about, um, that, that South Africa feels is very real. Um, and then finally, we look at some alternative revenue recycling options. Let's move away from a neutral scenario and let's look at what happens if we reduce corporate taxes, um, in which would favor business, as you will see, or if we, um, if we take all the, 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 the carbon tax revenues and we transfer them to poorer or to households, to poorer households. Um, right. Like I said, we start from the end of the decision on what to build in the energy sector, right? So the base case or the baseline, the unconstrained emissions scenario for South Africa has an energy profile that looks, or an electricity profile that looks something like the graph on the left. You can see the gray is coal, and coal is going to dominate electricity supply into the future. Additional analysis that was done um, on the far right says, well, what, what might the, a least cost energy plan look like for, for South Africa if it wanted to reduce its emissions by 42%? And you can see the green there is a much higher composition, uh, co contribution from renewables. Right? So there's a shift. There's a much greater cost to this. So the cost on the baseline is 108 billion US dollars over the next 20 years. On the far right hand side, or 25 years, on the far right hand side, it's 171 billion dollars in, in energy investments. It was decided that that was potentially too expensive, and so that South Africa has adopted, at least for now, the, the middle case scenario, the policy adjusted scenario, right? Which, um, which tries to balance the financial cost of, of meeting emissions, but also trying to reduce those emissions themselves. We don't quite know what the cost is because it was never reported, but, um, but you can see it's somewhere in between, okay? Presumably, it's, it, the cost is somewhere in between as well, and we would imagine it's closer to the left. What this means is that the energy, the electricity sector, which accounts for half of South Africa's emissions, is only going to reduce emissions by 19% by 2025. So it's going to fall far short of pulling its own weight in terms of meeting the, the, the emissions reduction targets. And that means that the heavy lifting is going to have to be done by a carbon tax. I'm going to shoot through some slides. There's a lot of detail in the paper, which is actually, I saw, it was one of the few that was printed out and being handed out for free. 
um, despite the carbon implications. The, um, what you can see here are changes in emissions reduction scenarios. And the, um, the big thing to draw away from this is that uh, what we found is that a 30 US dollar per ton carbon tax is needed in order for South Africa to meet its emissions reduction targets, given that the electricity sector is only pulling a certain portion of its weight in, in, in meeting those targets. Um, you can see that if we, just, if we didn't introduce a carbon tax and we just implemented the, the electricity build plan, we would only reduce uh, emissions at the national level by 8.6%. But um, but, the, um, but with, with $30 per tonne and with a carb tax on the rest of the economy, we can see that, that the, re the other sectors reduce their, would have to reduce their emissions by, by more than 50%, and that's what's necessary in order for South Africa to meet its, its emissions targets. What is the implications for economic growth? Because this is what we're focused on, e economic growth and changes in employment. What we looked at are different levels of carbon taxes. And what are the implications for economic growth, um, which is the white line on the left-hand graph, and what's the implications for employment? These are reductions in GDP growth in 2025 relative to the, uh, the unconstrained, um, the who cares scenario. Um, and so you can see with the 30 US dollar per ton carbon tax, South Africa is losing about 1.05, 1 1% of GDP as a result of the carbon tax. And you can see what, what is interesting, and in, in a sense this is an abatement cost curve, and you can see for, for, for at the national level, and you can see that the costs ratchet up very quickly after about 20 US dollars per ton. Right? The reason for that is because, of course, when the carbon tax is first implemented, we start to reduce our emissions in the sectors where it's easiest to reduce them. Right? There are a few sectors where emissions are very high, and if worst case scenarios, we shut some of them down. Those are particularly the mining sectors. And so to begin with, and this is what's being shown on the right-hand side, most of those emissions reductions or the sources of, of GDP losses at low carbon taxes are the gray areas, which are the, the mining sectors. That's where, that's where the GDP is lost. But as the tax starts to increase, we have to start squeezing a lot of sectors that actually are not that carbon intensive. Those are the service sectors, um, which are the white, at the very, the white uh, shaded area at the very top. And so it gets increasingly more difficult to reduce those emissions further over time if the electricity sector doesn't play and pull its own share. Okay. What is the implications for income distribution? Oh, one more minute. The, um, what we have there is this is changes in household consumption, or in a way a measure of welfare, um, with and without the carbon tax. And you can see how we have on the bottom x-axis, we have the poorest households on the left and the richest households on the right. And we can see that the, the sales tax is, in fact, a very neutral revenue recycling uh, approach. Households do lose um, uh, welfare. They do, their consumption is lower as a result of the carbon tax, in part because the economy is smaller as a result of the carbon tax. But the impacts are fairly smoothly distributed across the income distribution. On the other hand, if we, um, if we recycle the revenues by reducing the corporate tax rate, which is a fairly attractive option for a lot of businesses, in other words, this could come about through accelerated depreciation of those existing energy intensive technologies so that you can replace them more quickly, um, you can see that a lot of the benefits accrue to the highest income households, who are the major beneficiaries of the dividends that are being paid by, um, by, by, from, from corporations. Likewise, there's, and, and of course, the situation then becomes worse for the low-income households who are not receiving those benefits or the reduction in the sales tax. Conversely, if we switch to a social, a social transfers program where we use these revenues to expand on existing social transfer programs, then of course, a lot of the benefits fall onto the higher-income households and those, uh, onto the lower-income households and the higher-income households are, are then worse off relative to some of the other scenarios. What is most interesting for us is, remember we did that scenario where we said, what happened if the rest of the world imposes a tax? Right. And, but South Africa doesn't. It poses a tax on South African exports. And there you can see that that's the black line at the bottom, and that's almost the worst case scenario for every single household group. And one of the reasons why is because there's no taxes collected by South Africa that could be recycled. Right? So one of the advantages of, of being a, a fast mover and implementing the carbon tax itself is that South Africa then collects the revenues and gets to decide how they're distributed. And that will really minimize some of the, uh, some of the welfare losses. So just to summarize, um, and I haven't shown you enough evidence to prove all of these points. You'll have to read the paper to, to take my word for it. But, um, but we find, yes, it's true. We need to be honest, right? There is a lot of opportunity for green growth and green jobs. No denying it. But overall, carbon taxes are likely to reduce national welfare and employment in South Africa. And so South Africa is likely to be, its economy is likely to be about 1.2% smaller by 2025 and 0.6% um, fewer jobs as a result of the carbon tax, as a result of trying to meet those emissions targets. 
without the electricity sector um, pulling its fair share. But these effects are fairly small in terms of economic growth rates, right? less than 0.1% per year in, in the annual economic growth rate. The welfare and employment losses are much larger if South Africa's um, trading partners decide to penalize South Africa for its inaction. Right? And so there's a real incentive for South Africa to be a first mover um, on this particular, uh, on, on, on carbon taxes. We find, and this is fairly controversial in South Africa and is probably unlikely ever to see the light of day, but we find that a border tax adjustment is actually a very significant instrument for um, eliminating some of those competitiveness concerns that Rob was talking about, while still not really uh, changing South Africa's ability, while still being able to meet South Africa's emissions reduction targets, right, which is the key. And so for us, this is, this is a politically expedient instrument, and it's also one which, which makes for us a certain amount of economic sense. And so we think it's a win-win, but like I said, it's a, it's a tough sell in the global scene, and it's also a fairly difficult instrument to implement. And so we recognize that, and part of the work that Rob was presenting was to show that it could potentially be done. Um, uh, and that was the very detailed analysis that was in the first presentation. And then finally, of course, the mode of revenue recycling is fundamental for determining the welfare implications. Um, who are the winners and who are the losers? For us, this is actually some way of saying that there are actually instruments out there that South Africa can use to try and smooth the impacts across different household groups and to try and respond to some of those different concerns that Rob was talking about in his first presentation. Thanks very much. Mm -hmm.